just sitting right on the surface. And here's uh, the drill core itself. Um, so it shows the, the borehole after drilling. Uh, one of the interesting things was that it only took uh, like a couple of minutes to get these cores. Um, some, some setup time, but once you got the drill in the ground, it was like two minutes of drilling to get a, a core. Whereas with the robotic system, in my experience, is that would be like a month. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty efficient way to proceed once you have a human on the surface. Um, the other thing is that uh, with a very simple tool, you could uh, adapt to a lot of different situations. In this case, we wanted to get uh, samples of these layered deposits, but we couldn't get up to the top and drill down in them. And actually, even if we had, there was a cap of a different type of rock on the, t on the top of this. Um, but here is a place where uh, a piece of it had broken off and fallen down, but it was horizontal. So we just drilled into it horizontally. Worked perfectly. Um, here's an example where we were interested in uh, this um, kind of erratic structure here was sticking out from this cliff wall and we wanted to know was it extending underground and just drilled basically at an angle to see if it continued underground. Uh, again, you'd have a completely different robotic system for those three situations. Um, robots aren't very adaptable. Okay, so finally moving on to the uh, human factors aspect. One, one of the uh, interesting things about most MDRS crews, and this being no exception, is the sort of diversity that's allowable and the different things that you can do to understand sort of the sociology of crews as a result of this diversity. Uh, this is a crew in uh, March that I was a part of, and there were two senior researchers, myself and John Clark is an Australian geologist. There were three French Air Force cadets who were 19 to 21 um, and a graduate student from Denmark. Um, and we were the crew of six. And um, everybody got along great and it worked out perfectly. And um, during uh, the Domex activities, we have kept track of how people spend their time. And um, in, in an effort to uh, get better data on what is the, um, both the amount of time you have available to do useful work versus, say, maintenance tasks, um, and what the distribution of that time would be. So this is uh, an accounting of 12 mission days, which amounts to 864 people hours. So it actually doesn't count sleep time. Um, and the blue areas were outdoors. How much time did we spend outdoors? And the red areas were how much time did we spend indoors? And then we have the how did this break down? Um, to my surprise, we actually had really very efficient, 41% of our time was on EVA. And that, that would be fabulous if you were able to do this on another planet. Um, indoors, there was a uh, uh, distribution of uh, EVA planning, sample analysis, uh, maintenance work. Um, and here's our robotic system. And some of the time was spent maintaining the robotic system, and that is uh, been my experience is that typically anytime you have a robotic system you're spending a substantial fraction of your time uh, working on it. Um, but in any case this is a, a very interesting way of getting data that is useful to future mission planning. Um, <clears throat> here's a uh, another way of looking at that data and this is the breakdown by day showing how does a, an activity like this evolve over time, where the first four days were basically uh, exploration. And so the time distribution was different than the middle four days, which were primarily focused on, um, on doing uh, sample collection and sample preparation and uh, getting ready to uh, put this robotic system out. And then the last three days were the actual work with the robotic system. So again, using these to uh, help you know how to plan astronaut time can be very, very valuable. Um, the uh, 
Educational aspect, uh, again, this, these activities are really an important way to train students. Um, we had students on each of the crews I was involved in, in this last year, and then in addition to that, we had four follow-up crews that were just students, so they didn't have any senior researchers with them. But all the student crews were required to present papers at technical meetings as a result of their have-stay activities. And this, I think, is uh, really important. If you're going to get people engaged in doing research, you have to force them to have products that they produce. So um, we now have order of 25 papers that have come out of these student crews. Every one of these students has had to give a, at least one paper at a scientific meeting. And the European students, this is actually Bernard Foing's idea, they presented at uh, COSPAR, the International Lunar Exploration Working Group, European Geophysical Union, um, Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, and we had several uh, papers at the Lunar Science Conference, which was like uh, a couple weeks ago. Okay, uh, one thing that is really another valuable thing about MDRS is having um, essentially continuity between crews. And th this is an example that happened essentially by accident, um, where the crew, a crew that followed my crew, learned that we had done a certain piece of work out there, and they were interested in, in, in particular, our work with the uh, ground penetrating radar. And they had a seismic station that they wanted to take out there, but they didn't know what they wanted to do with it. They had no uh, experience of the site, and so they contacted me saying, we're going to take a seismic station out there. Where would you suggest we set it up? So I sent them back to our site, um, and they did a seismic survey. And then they fed back to me what their seismic results were, which influenced me to do a subsequent crew uh, where I changed the location of my ground penetrating radar and redid my survey and therefore got better results. So it's this interaction of one crew influence what another crew does and sort of building on the learning. And uh, this is um, Brian Shiro, who was a crew commander after me, and I did a paper at Lunar and Planetary Science and at the Lunar Science Forum. This is Brian's poster at Lunar Science Forum, which is uh, uh, an interesting illustration of this interaction. Okay, so just a summary of some of these results. Um, what we found is that uh, this is really a good way to train students. Not a surprise, but if you put a couple of senior scientists together with the student crew, um, they learn an awful lot that they probably wouldn't learn otherwise. Um, and this kind of activity has a very high, valuable, very high value for inspiring the next generation. Um, the international and the multi-gender and the multi-age crew mixes were very successful. There were no interpersonal or communication problems that I experienced. Um, simulations at MDRS, in my opinion, is a very highly cost-effective way to simulate mission scenarios from end to end. I've been trying to convince NASA of this <laughs> in the last year. Um, and uh, hopefully we can keep this program going. Um, the uh, astronaut towed ground penetrating radar was very successful, identified a subsurface channel. Um, and uh, the astronaut operated drill was very successful. Even though this isn't a flight prototype, it's representative of the type, I think, and mass of drilling system that can be utilized by astronauts. Um, in the coming months, I will be taking a more, um, a bigger robotic drill out to MDRS and We'll be doing uh, further work in that area. Here's uh, some acknowledgement of the various people that have helped me in collaboration and collaborators. Um, most importantly, Mars Desert Research Stations provided by Mars Society, uh, Artemis Westenberg, and a dedicated team of Mars Society volunteers make this happen. If you have a chance to help, I encourage you to do so. One question on the drill, the handheld drill, was that a battery operated or 
The, the, we saw the guy holding, was that a battery operated drill or? Uh, no, that, that particular device is um, something called the Shaw Backpack Drill. Uh, it's a commercial device and it's uh, meant for uh, field operations by geologists. Um, and it is a small gasoline engine. Oh, okay. So like a, a two stroke. Like a weed whacker. Yeah, like a weed whacker engine. Okay. Uh, the ground pen penetrating radar, have you. Uh, done anything in terms of interpreting the signal uh, more more quantitatively or just sort of looked at it to kind of figure what's going on? Um, any any computer analysis? There hasn't been any computer analysis other than just looking at it. Um, we, yeah. uh, I in particular, don't really have any prior experience with ground penetrating radar. Anybody who does and wants to help <laughs> would be happy to have their help. All right, thank you. I hope I'm going to use the right vocabulary here. I'm not a ge geologist, which will be obvious. The, the little concretions or nodules that you found at, at uh, Kissing Camel Ridge, were they similar chemically to the so-called blueberries? Um, good question. On, Mar on Mer at yeah. Meridiani? Yeah, good question. Um, that was actually one of the things that we looked at. Um, we brought these back to the lab and we did uh, x-ray diffraction uh, spectroscopy to determine their mineralogy. The blueberries um, are sulfate rich concretions, so the cementing agent is sulf or sulfate, probably uh, anhydrite, um, <clears throat> and the, uh, the grains are hematite rich and that's what makes them dark, is the hematite. Uh, these are sand or silica grains, and the cementing agent is calcium carbonate. So chemically, they're different. Um, in fact, one of the major puzzles on Mars has been the lack of evidence for calcium carbonate. Um, and in fact, um, it wasn't until the blueberries were discovered and they were analyzed that it was realized that the reason there doesn't seem to be any calcium carbonate on Mars is because the environment has been very acidic and acid essentially um, dissolves calcium carbonate. In fact, if you want to do a field test for calcium carbonate, you drop acid on it and it makes it fizz and, and decompose. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that would happen in some future manned expedition to Mars would be deep drilling to try to get down not only just for geological samples but also for possible biological samples and samples of possible uh, brine layer and that they could be at depths of one or more kilometers. So I just wonder if you've been in touch with anyone who's investigated how light uh, uh, the equipment could be uh, that would be equivalent to water well or even oil well drilling scale equipment that would require human beings.